Welcome to another episode of Garage 419. Joining me on the program today, Mr. Davey Johnson, the only person out there, well, one of many people out there, who know so much more about cars than me. It's frightening. Welcome, Davey. Hey, man. How are you? Now, I just learned that there is a line to go see, uh, to go watch uh, in studio uh, Top Gear in England. And I just found out that line is 336,000 people long, which translates into a 21 year waiting, waiting list. Uh, we actually have a picture of that waiting list. Let's go to that. And whoa, that's serious. That's long. Yeah. Uh, that's so it's just about as long as the line for uh, mid 30s Long Island women waiting for Bon Jovi tickets. Anyway, moving right along. The European Focus. Davey, are you familiar with the European Ford Focus? I am Focus? familiar with the European Ford Focus. Apparently in 2011, they're finally bringing that model to the U.S. Why do you think it's taken so long for Ford to realize that its European models are actually better quality than their domestic models? Well, I don't think they haven't realized that. From what I've heard, Mulally's been screaming to get the European models over here since, since he came on board, uh, which is probably part of the benefit of having an outsider come in to do the, uh, you know, to run the company. Yeah. Like a guy who's not in the auto industry saying like, hey, you know, here are the great products that we've got company-wide, how do we get them into this market? The problem is, uh, in Europe, they're used to premium small cars. Uh -huh. uh, it's, a, it's a standard, it's standard operating procedure over there that there are small cars in the premium segment. And until this gas crunch, Americans didn't even want to know. I mean, look at the, the Audi A3 sales versus golf sales. Well, but you got to think that that if a, if a company can make a car better, why, why would they send that better car overseas and not just sell it here where people, you know, where it's their target market? Because only poor people buy small cars here. Hmm. Oh, I, I, well, actually you got a point there. You know, and, and when it's more profitable <laughs> to sell right, a 10-year-old truck design. I thought I'd have know, a response for that. I don't, you're right. <laughs> you know, small cars are for poor people. I mean, this may be changing now. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, you drive a small car. I do, and I'm and I'm rich as f no. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, you're <dead>. No, but I mean, actually, you know, Mercedes S Class sales are down. A lot, the large sedan sales are down, and obviously SUV sales are way down. So I guess the uh, the rich are going to need a premium economy car, huh? Right. Exactly. And I mean, I think like the middle class is yeah. going to want premium quality cars, and that you know, and that that Ford platform that underpins the Mazda 3 and the C30 and has underpinned the European focus for years now will finally come to America and we'll, who knows, maybe it'll save Ford. Well, I hope their sales are good enough that actually they realize, well, wow, we should have been doing that the whole time. And now we've got, let's got, we've got new models now. Uh, we've got finally uh, pictures of the Lotus Eagle. We don't know what it'll be finally called, but they say Project Eagle. And I actually think it looks, you know, kind of nice. Have you, have you, what do you think about this thing? You know, I don't know. I'm still, I'm waiting for the Esprit. I mean, I don't know, maybe they're going to call this the Esprit, but like, you know, it's like, oh, well, here's the Europa, but it's still not the Esprit. And it's like, I want something from Lotus that makes me feel like when I stand next to an Esprit S1, to this day, like, I want to sing the James Bond music. Like, <laughs> I want that feeling of, like, magnificent awesome from a Lotus that, yeah. although I, like, adore and respect the Elise, like, it doesn't, and the Exige, they don't quite give me that feeling that the old Lotuses do. I could stare at a vintage Europa all day and just, like, fantasize. And... It, Right now, Lotus doesn't have anything, and I'm hoping that the Esprit will be the thing that makes Lotus feel special to me. Yeah. Well, I actually, I don't know why they went with a 2, two plus 2, which they're saying the new Lotus Eagle will be. 2 plus 2 to me says 2 plus a really cushy place to store your bags, because, I mean, no one ever fits in the back of a 2 plus 2. So I don't really see the point of that. Maserati Gran Turismo. Okay. That, it's I'll, the one I'll two give you plus that one. two that yeah. you can carry people in. I'll give you that one. But in the Vanquish, it, my seat is literally touching right. the back 12. seat. It's so stupid. But in the Eagle, I, I like the interior. The dash is nice and simple. And it's it's got a Camry engine in it, which basically means you can beat the crap out of it all day long well, for 20,000 miles. The body panels will fall off before That's true. the motor breaks. But, you know, you've got it's going to be a sports car. They said it's faster around the Nürburgring than an Elise. Um, and it's, it's, it's got better road mannerisms than the Exige, so it actually, there's going to be a market out there for that car, I think. What about its bedside manner? It's, you know, friendly in the morning, which I like. I'm good for that. I don't know. I always like crotchety girls, so I can go get them coffee and make them happy. <laughs> okay, so you I want like, like, a, I like, you want like a, a Lotus elevator. 7, right? You need something a little more moody. Yeah, exactly. Temperamental. All right. Yeah. Coming up on Garage 419, we're going to talk about what's happening in the aftermarket business now that car sales are down and gas prices are up, as well as supercar fuel economy and the question of the day. Stick around. Once again, you are wrong. How am I wrong, Lloyd? You are trying to ruin the moral fiber of America. <laughs> 
This is getting ridiculous. And I'm back with Davy Johnson, automotive writer extraordinaire. Uh, now, Nopi is an organization uh, of aftermarket uh, parts manufacturers and distributors, and what they do is put on events for people to do track and drift days, and they, they sell their wares uh, at these events. Now, they have canceled all their events for the rest of 2008 because the aftermarket is so bad right now. Um, Dave, are you one of those guys that has an addiction to, to modding your car like I do? Well, the, the problem that I have with Nopi, just in general, is that their logo is like a smiley face with an eyebrow ring, <laughs> uh, which is just... Well, they keep it gangster. Dude, that's not gangster, that's just <laughs> ass hat. So, you know, I mean, you sell the ass hats, the ass hats lose their jobs, and... You know, what are they going to do? They got no money to put gas in the Civic and, yeah. you know, they're in the turlet. So, I mean, frankly, like, I don't have anything against modded Civics. I don't have anything against modifying your car, but, and I, do, I certainly don't have anything against drifting. I love drifting. But, you know, the problem that I have is just, like, the, the idiot pandering and Nopi excelled at that. So, like, I'm really not sorry to see it go. So you just think they get what they deserve? Yeah, exactly. I'm just, I, it sucks for these, I mean, because there's a lot of companies out there that are, you know, especially specialized markets, you know, when I had an S4, I'd be, I was buying parts from little tiny manufacturers that I know, you know, if all of a sudden gas prices are up, car sales are down, and people can't afford the extras, I know a lot of these companies that make really high quality stuff are going to go out of business, and yeah, I just but don't want to see that happen. I think a lot of the high quality companies who, who work small are actually probably going to do all right because people are going to seek them out, and those guys are serious. What's going to be interesting is to see what happens to companies like the Edelbrocks and the Hollies of the world who turn out a lot of like cheap made yeah. in China type parts. I mean, they all, they I'm have pretty sure they're made too. in the U.S. though. Um, Edelbrock's yeah. made in China? Edelbrock, well, Edelbrock, they say made in the U.S., but it's, you know, made by, you know, like Mexicans in a factory in Torrance somewhere. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, <laughs> made, counts. technically made in the U.S. <laughs> the asterisk. <laughs> So I, I, I hope that, you know, although the rest of their events for 08 are done, I hope the, uh, the aftermarket suppliers survive. Now, the supercars of the world, uh, the, the supercar manufacturers are, are, are all of a sudden much more concerned with fuel economy because that middle of the range person who could just barely get into that Ferrari is all of a sudden concerned and, and might not be able to afford it. You've got cars like the Fisker Karma Hybrid coming out to compete with the Quattro Porte. Uh, you've got the Tesla Roadster, and you've got a uh, Porsche using the direct gas injection to save fuel economy. Where do you think the, the right direction is for, for these cars, Davey? Well, I mean, ideally, you know, optimum operating efficiency uh, is key in engine development. So I don't have any problem with supercars getting more efficient. Getting more efficient as a marketing angle, I think, just like kind of reeks of some weird hypocrisy, however. Yeah, but I, it seems like these cars, I mean, really are more, it's not It's not like they're just selling it. I mean, they really, see, the Fisker, uh, the Karma, they say you can go 65 miles on battery alone. Right. So, I mean, and, and it, it, the engines don't even kick on until highway speeds, which is kind of cool. Yeah, the Fisker's one thing. I think, you know, on the other hand, it, it's like, you know, you're trying to sell, like, say, the new Porsches on fuel economy. I mean, Porsches have always gotten pretty good mileage relative to, like, what they actually are. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you know, trying to sell an economy to somebody who's already laying out that kind of money on the car, it's like if you can't afford the car, you can't afford the car. And and honestly, fifty cents a gallon, like here or there, is not. If it makes a difference, you shouldn't be driving it. Well, I just think with the Porsches using the direct gas injection, that technology goes two ways because that can either give you more power or more economy depending on how you're and driving. And according to Porsche, the new DI motors do both. So yeah. it's kind of win-win. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a more efficient use of the engine, which is always a good thing. Right. And then you've exactly. also got BMW dropping their M5 from a 10-cylinder to a twin-turbo 8, you know, next year. And Ferrari is looking to do that as well with their Enzo replacement. Um, now, do you think, I've also heard rumors of a hybrid Ferrari. What do you think about that? Well. You know, honestly, Ferrari, it's it's amazing what they do, and they are a powertrain company, first and foremost, and people tend to forget that because their chassis development's gotten so good, but old man Enzo really couldn't have given a flying toss about, you know, they, they went to disc brakes late, they, yeah. they abandoned wire wheels late. I mean, Ferrari, as a technology company, they were really only concerned with engines for years and years and years, so, you know... Ferrari doing a hybrid, I'm interested to see. I mean, I'm sure it'll be, you know, some kind of flywheel-based F1-derived system because well, they, the they sell yeah. all that racing heritage. Yeah, when you, when, you, when you bring the hybrid down from your Formula One program and not up from a Prius program, right. it makes it a little less bad. That lead brings well, does it make it bad? I mean, is, is, yeah. is, is it bad to have 
another kind of system generating energy. I mean, there are some people who would want to say, you know, V12 front engine, that's what a Ferrari should right. be. But the fact of the matter is Ferrari built four cylinder cars too in the old days. So, yeah. Well, you the, know. the question of the day is actually about just that. Is a hybrid Ferrari sacrilege? Is, do, do Ferraris all need B12 cylinder cars and rev high and waste gas? And is that what a Ferrari should be? Or could a, could a Ferrari invoke some of these new technologies? We want to know. Leave a comment and, uh, and let me know what you think. Now, as we close out this episode of Garage 419, a little tidbit I want you to know about. We are going to give back to the fans a little bit, so to speak. And we're going to be having an event. It's going to be a go-kart race. We're going to have pros and we're going to have fans racing together on the same track. Stay tuned to Garage 419 in the next few weeks and we will let you know exactly what you need to know to be a part of the Garage 419 Invitational. Until next week, I'm Matt Davey. Thanks so much for being on the show, dude. Thank you, Matt. Always love talking about cars with you, and I'm out of here.